uh, putting on series for people. Now, um, I see one new person, Donna Meltonar. where are you from? Maybe just unmute her for a sec there. And uh, I know Rebecca's over there in Port Angeles and Mahala in Polsbo. I am in Lake Stevens. Okay, relatively close. Okay, great. Well, welcome aboard. And at various times I ask for questions, but anytime anybody does have a question and you're muted, if you just raise your hand real obviously and wave it vigorously in front of the camera, uh, then we'll, Evelyn will notice. <laughs> but, uh, or I may, or I'm at different points, I may ask for questions. Um, yeah, and you're also able to unmute yourself as well. Um, a lot of times it's the bottom left-hand corner of the screen. So feel free to do that if you've got a burning question. And I see a couple more people that are new are showing up here. I've got uh, Lisa and Clinton. Um, so welcome folks. Uh, my name is Evelyn. I'm with the, I'm the Thin River host. And any questions that you folks have uh, as far as technology or the insider space goes, please uh, drop that right to me. Um, and otherwise, I will go ahead and hand it back over to Michael, who will be uh, talking today about ecosystem restoration camps. So thanks so much for all of you to, uh, being here. Okay, well, I'll just uh, get going here. There's so much to say today. Maybe perhaps this is my favorite topic on earth. Um, as, um, yeah, so the in back of me uh, is a little bit of my library in particular that this is the top three shelves are my books on ecosystem restoration and someday I'm going to review them all but uh, haven't got I've any rate. So there's one of the jobs still to do is sort of do a comprehensive review of what books are in my library. I've been through I've been collecting books for many, many years on rest ecosystem restoration. Um, basically since they invented the term in the mid 70s. The, um, so Michael Polarski, Friends of the Trees Society. And today I mainly want to give a lot of plugs for the earth, the ecosystem restoration camps. This is a, um, the ecosystem restoration camps is an international organization and it was started by, or at least conceived of, and really shepherded along by John D. Liu. And many of you probably know who John Liu is, but a Chinese American filmmaker who has really brought restoration to large scale ecosystem restoration to the world's attention. So he had the idea of starting some camps uh, where people could get together and do hands-on ecosystem restoration of a particular landscape, a particular piece of property. And so it took him some years of promoting that before the first one happened. And that was about, oh, I guess maybe two, three, maybe even as much as three years ago, two years ago, two and a half years ago, the uh, ecosystem, first ecosystem restoration camp was started in the Altiplano of Spain. And it was a degraded old, you know, an old landscape farmed for centuries and degraded and then pretty much abandoned. There's quite a bit of space in Spain and France of abandoned landscapes, small villages falling into ruin. And in a few of those places, new back to the landers are moving into those uh, decrepit villages and starting to do restoration in their neighborhood. So there's, um, you might say it's a worldwide movement, but in the case of John Liu's ecosystem restoration camps, it's pretty new. The, the one in Altiplano ran for well over a year. I don't know the exact timing, but at one point it closed down and then it's recently reopened. They have recently just really um, got a lot more uh, initiatives going in, in other countries. So before there was one ecosystem restoration camp. Now there's, depending on how you want to count them, uh, at least dozens in the works. And if you go to their website, ecosystemrestorationcamps.org, you will, you will find their, their list of, of where the different camps are and how you can sign up. So it's a volunteer um, thing. People sign up and go for varying lengths of time. But the goal, I think, is for 
in the initial part of this was that people were going to go there for months at any rate or, or a year or really go there and sink their roots in a bit. Whereas um, some of the camps are more short term, like people come and go more frequently, maybe just a week or a weekend even, but people come and go. So, um, so at any rate, so this camps, is, is, it's a growing movement. Uh, and this is a particular example of it. And they recently, uh, they just, they're just about to start their first restoration, ecosystem restoration course, ecosystem restoration design course, heavily influenced by permaculture. And I tried to get on board, but I was too late. And so I can't even take the course till January, 2021. So you could take a course on this. Um, so other types of ecosystem restoration camps. I've been promoting the idea for years of ecosystem restoration communities where people actually get titled to a piece of land or very long-term lease, let's say a 99 year lease or something so it can be passed on through the generations. And that these people move to a degraded spot in the landscape. Uh, I can think of lots of really decrepit ranches in the Western US, for instance, that would be good candidates. And um, somehow the, the, uh, the land is mortgaged or somehow they get, uh, they get uh, access to the land. They can build their own simple houses. They can grow their own gardens, put in orchards et cetera, raise, and, 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 and at the same time as they're doing this homesteading, they're doing a lot of landscape rehabilitation on the place. So that's part of their job is to restore that particular degraded landscape, but they get to be a community there and live there happily there ever after, at, or at least a long term. So 30 year lease, at, at, you know, that kind of thing at any rate. So that's a restoration community. In some places it can be purchased and owned, some places it could be land trust. There's many different uh, possibilities. And I actually lived in communities in the 1980s and 90s, 70s, 80s, 90s. And we did that sort of thing. I remember getting a 520 acre old uh, property. It was, you know, old property, but it was a, a old, uh, a, it's actually a ghost town. and up in the mountains and it had lots of fertile land as well as, uh, and we were able to actually help the land grow bigger trees, the soil improve. We, grad we actually were improving the ecosystem by living there and making our living. So I actually got to experience that and it's quite a lovely way to go. Another example, a personal example of mine is that I was part of the farm brigade uh, this was in 1972 in Eastern Washington. And we set up a camp for people to help organic farmers and to have our own little organic farm. So we weren't out to restore ecosystems. We were out to, in a sense, you might say that, restore farmland from non-organic to organic. At least we were helping organic friends. So, um, so we were part of the early organic movement. And we had this farm brigade and 150 people came through our camp that year. It lasted a full growing season from April until November. And um, we, we, our interns, or you might call them interns, or our, our volunteers went to help about 15 different farms in the neighborhood. So we were, we were volunteering to do something useful. We set up our own little village. We had a, a shack two shacks, I think, uh, open air shacks to start with. And we created out, an outdoor kitchen, a, a campfire. We lived there together all summer in tents, et cetera. And it was uh, one of the most, one of the best experiences of my life. I was in my twenties and we had just had a great time and a lot of camaraderie. And so I think a lot of young people in this world need more camaraderie, we need uh, like-minded people to work with for a common good. Now that we have a huge amount of unemployed people in the United States and around the world, I mean, Afghanistan, the unemployment rate was 70% before COVID. <laughs> Zimbabwe, I think it's somewhere in the order of 50%. That's official un un unemployment uh, before COVID. 
But here in the, in, but at any rate, as we know, there are just huge amounts of unemployed people around the world. How can they be organized into ecosystem restoration camps or who would volunteer? This should all be totally voluntary. Uh, I don't believe, I don't like to go with government enforced uh, work camps or anything like that. So free will volunteers, though it, they could be paid for. And here's an example from history. I wonder how many of you people have heard of the CCC, Civilian Conservation Corps. Raise your hands, I can see a couple of you. Okay, so the CCC was, ran from 1933 to 1943. And I have here a book on it here called The Tree Army, A Pictorial History of the Civilian Conservation Corps, 1933-1942. At any rate, this is a great source of information about the CCC. Um, President, this happened during the last Great Depression. Uh, and so that things were really bad, unemployment was high, a lot of people were unhappy. And so Franklin Delano Roosevelt, uh, with the help of Richard St. Barb Baker, actually, and some other uh, you know, good people, came up with the idea of a CCC to put people to work. And they put uh, over 2 million young, in those days it was young men, they didn't have any women much at these camps. It was a, a male workforce and they were, they set up over 2,000 camps all across the United States. They planted trees, did ecosystem restoration, erosion control, put in windbreaks and shelter belts, built state park pavilions, and uh, did all kinds of useful work uh, in the country. It was maybe the first and last time that a major government has funded ecosystem restoration to a fairly good tune, these people got paid 40, I think it was 30 or $40 a month, which was big money in those days. I mean, it was a reasonable, you know, it was a reasonable stipend, you might say. So it wasn't much, that's a month, mind you, $30 a month, $40 a month, not a day. Um, and uh, the, they, um, the young men learned good skills, they did good work. There's of course a lot of camaraderie and, uh, and then World War II happened and they shipped them all off to the front lines for the most part. Uh, and it's interesting to note then that, that the money for the CCC stopped. Uh, it is interesting to know that in today's world, billions, hundreds of billions and trillions of dollars are spent on the military, army and wars, but only pennies are given to ecosystem restoration. What is more important on the earth, ecosystem rest restoration or more wars? The answer is obvious. So ecosystem restoration camps in all their forms are what we really um, need to work on. So a couple more words about the ecosystem restoration camps. They have a YouTube channel. I recommend, and they, there's no, you know, it wouldn't take too long to go through all their YouTubes. Uh, and there's a related material course, but uh, there's a, good food for thought there. Um, and then also check out their, their website. So um, we do hope to drive a little more traffic there. And of course, we'll be sending this video. I, Evelyn, I imagine you have this on, uh, on uh, recording um, because we'll want to send this one out uh, to the world and to um, the restoration camps themselves. Okay, what to know about plants. So recently, or actually not too recently, uh, over a little over a year ago, John D. Lou mentioned me joining the Board of Advisors for the Ecosystem Restoration Camps. And I haven't really done anything to, uh, to, to, to do that. However, I'm currently in the process of drafting a, uh, a letters of uh, recommendation to Ecosystem Restoration Camps of how they approach the um, learning more about herbs, plants, weeds in their, in, uh, you know, where they're working. Every ecosystem restoration camp is working on a particular piece of land. Some are bigger, probably some are smaller, but there's always plants there. Uh, and so what are the plants on the site and how can they fit into, how can that knowledge fit into the functioning of the ecosystem restoration camps? The, some of the ecosystem restoration camps are funded, they, they, they collect funds, and so they can help 
financially with the camps. Um, but there's, it's obvious that there's a lot more need for camps than there are funds. And so we could use, um, if the camps could be a little more self-reliant and produce some more of their own goods, that's to the benefit of the camp, makes them a little bit more cost effective, you might say. So uh, learn, knowing all the wild edibles uh, on the property is really, would be a good thing to know. Now, there's a lot of different variation in the wild edibles here. You might have, uh, on the one hand, a common weed that people don't like and they're trying to reduce on the site and it happens to be edible and actually tastes good. Um, that could become part of the diet. While they're trying to eradicate it, they might as well eat it. So uh, knowing all the wild non-native edibles is good. There may be a bunch of uh, native edibles on site and there's enough of it that that can be harvested. Um, and in which case, in a sustainable harvest. And let's say there's a few bulb plants of some edible bulb left of some native plant and there's the last ones on the place. Well, obviously you're not going to eat them. So we ha you know, any use of native plants has to be done in a, uh, in a restorative manner. The goal of the restoration, I'm gonna have to jump ahead of here a little bit. The goal of the restoration is to restore the landscape's functions, uh, structure, more of the native species and native fauna, native microorganisms, etc. It's it's a changing ball game. You never can go back to the past. But how do we uh, how do we increase those wild edible bulb plants in this in the system? How do we get more berries and fruits uh, growing in the ecosystem? so that there's more food for the people that live there and for the animals for that matter. So um, the part of the goal of, to me, part of the goal, and, the, and this will vary from place to place of the ecosystem restoration camp or that particular project is to, can also be to produce food and resources for the people involved or for the local neighborhood. Uh, so, we can, as the indigenous people did, sort of stack the ecosystem towards more edible and useful and desired species. All indigenous people, all hunter-gatherers, all horticultural peoples uh, stack their environment to, their, to, the, to a certain degree with plants that were useful to them. They manage the environment to improve and increase food systems and, and, and desired plants. Unlike modern man who almost always just depletes the useful plants, we deplete the old way was to increase the useful plants. And so the restoration movement could take a good lead from indigenous uh, peoples uh, and actually get more food in the landscape rather than say um, as, as part of the restoration. So some foods are really come quickly. There's annual crops. There's things that take two, three, four, five years before they come into bearing. There's things that take 10, 15, 20 even. So uh, an ecosystem restoration uh, could be incorporating useful and edible plants to keep the people, help keep the community alive, so to speak, or the, or the project alive, starting from pretty much from day one. What can you throw out in the environment? Uh, just seeds, native seeds that are going to be useful in the short term as well as long term. Okay, so I made a list of any questions on all that. You know, it's like I'm I'm all, I'm gonna wound up here, but any questions or comments, thoughts before I shift gears. Okay, if you, so I give a lot of plant walks. I've done uh, hundreds of plant walks. And one of the things I, I like to start with is telling people what I'm looking for uh, to learn when I live in an ecosystem. So if I, I hear I live today in Port Hadlock, Washington, before that it was, Hot Springs, Montana. But wherever I live, my goal is I go out and I start walking around and looking at plants. That's just like, 
um, one of the first, it's part of life is that you should always be walking around looking at plants at least part of it every day uh, or if you can and uh, the idea of a lockdown where they won't let people walk around is is actually kind of like uh, what they do in prison to torture and 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 imprison people uh, lock them up solitary and stuff so solitary confinement is actually considered a bad form of torture interesting that they've come up with that for uh, for the world here. Um, so, but thank goodness I'm a farmer. I'd advise everybody to become a farmer because farmers can still farm and, and, and pursue their, their uh, occupation, at least in the, in the United States. I did just read in some, one country actually did forbid the farmers from going out and farming. I can't, I just like, I'll have to look that up to see we really was some country that dumb. Um, so at any rate, what do I want to know about plants? I want to know, I walk around, I want to know the common name and the Latin name of all the plants. And I want to know that which ones are native and which ones are non-native. So that means I have to I, identify them. And so there's a lot of ways to learn your identification. And um, one of the, my main ones has been buying field guides, um, plant field guides for the area I live. And then just for breakfast, lunch, or dinner, and dinner, just sit there and go through that book page by page and look at every picture and read a little bit and just sort of familiar, you know, start familiarizing myself. And then when I'm out in the field running around with my field guide, I can say, oh, I think that was so-and-so, look it up, and there it is, and say, okay, I, you know, I've got that one more or less nailed down. So you just, it's a gradual process. Going on plant walks is one of the very, very best ways to learn about plants. So, um, so I'm going to advise all ecosystem restoration camps is that they have frequent plant walks. And there can be two kinds, and I'm, here's, here's how to, do, here's a, uh, there's several different kinds, um, but here's one I think that, that any camp can do whether they have much expertise in the group or not. Everybody on the, in the camp goes out for an hour or maybe two hours even, maybe one hour is pretty good, and they walk around and they try to find 10 plants that they know, wild plants, and 10 plants that they don't know. Um, and bring back a little sample, a leaf, a twig, a flower, you know, a, a little something of it. Uh, if it's just a tiny little plant and there's only one, well, maybe you can't take that leaf or something. But for, for most things, we can take a tiny sample and you bring that back to the group. And everybody shows everybody their 10 and their 10, if they got that many. And they say, these are the 10 I know, and here's their names. And then they say, here are the ones I don't know. Does anybody know these? And then somebody else in the group will know some of them. And so by the, by the time they've all gone around, they've all, they have all reinforced each other's knowledge a lot. They will have much more of a common understanding of what's out there. They'll have surveyed the, the flora to a certain extent. So that's a great learning exercise for an ecosystem restoration camp. Everybody's on the same foot. Nobody's the expert. It's just everybody, everybody goes out and, and does this. This is probably better in the early stages, of course, of a, of a camp rather than you know, a half a year in. The other thing the camps can do is bring in outside experts, such as myself or local indigenous people or traditional elders or uh, local native plant people, people that really know a lot about the plants in that area, come to the camp and give a plant walk. Pay them a little bit or offer them something or maybe some work trade. But, um, but a lot of people would be willing and happy to give a free plant walk for a, a ecosystem restoration camp. So you could certainly start out by, um, you know, depends who it is. If you're asking an indigenous uh, elder in your area, it's, it's, it is appropriate to offer them a gift. And not just assume that oh yeah we you know we just uh, they're just going to come for free. So we do want to honor people, especially indigenous people. A lot of regular people are like myself are quite happy to just uh, donate a plant walk. So ah uh, okay. So some of the other things I want to know. I want to know all the traditional uses of the plants and its modern uses. In other words, I need to know what did the native peoples of that area use it for? But let's say it's yarrow. 
well, my goodness, now there's a big task. I not only have to know uh, what the yarrow was used for by the local indigenous people, but I'll, what about the people in Russia and, and that, that had yarrow and the people in Norway, et cetera, et cetera. Yarrow has a huge distribution worldwide. And so in a sense, you'd have to know the ethnobotany of every people, in a sense, to really um, say you knew all the traditional uses. But you can certainly get most of what you need from studying one or two of the, uh, of the indigenous people. But you know, starting with your own is best. Um, so I would recommend that every ecosystem restoration camp identify the best, or you know, the best as far as they can tell, uh, ethnobotany books for their area. What were the tribes in their area? For instance, if when I lived, when I lived in Montana, I was on the territory of of the Salish and Kootenai tribes, for instance. And so studying their ethnobotany was really great. I could also study the Blackfoot and the Columbia Basin, et cetera, because they're close. But nothing would have been as good as studying the ethnobotany of the Salish Kootenai tribes. The, and now that I'm here in, uh, in Northeast Olympic Peninsula, I'm studying the ethnobotany of the, of the Skalalem tribes. So here's a, a publication I can turn you on to. It's called the Ethnobotany and Ethnoecology Resource Guide. I'm the author, along with a friend. Uh, and this is an international guide to ethnobotany and, eth and ethnoecology. It's heavy, of course, on North America and the Pacific Northwest, but we have sections for around the world. So that, that is just a guide that can help lead you to other guides. And of course, it's, it's, a, it's a vast world, the world of ethno ethnobotany today. But there'll probably be an ethnobotany uh, for your area somewhere. So each camp can identify those books. Those would be great to have in the, um, in the uh, camp library. Um, also, I mentioned field guides earlier. I recommend that all ecosystem restoration camps have uh, get some of the best local field guides, plant field guides for their area. That includes weeds as well as native plants. And so they have those field guides in their library for, for people to research. Um, so modern uses, of course, you have to know what's occurs, what we're using in the, in modern uh, pharmacopoeia, herbal medicines. Uh, there's there's a lot of knowledge in the old books and the ethnobotanies, but there's a lot of knowledge in more recent books as well. So we have to study what's going on in the world today. Um, there's a lot of uh, new uses for plants that that weren't traditional. Um, when, for each plant that you're utilizing, when is the optimum time to harvest it? That's a big question for me in my herbal wild crafting trade. I need to, uh, I need to know when is the best time to harvest that medicine? Is it before flowering, during flowering? Or when, what is the time? And then how do I process it? And Lisa, I don't know if you just, heard, but I just mentioned the Sklalem tribe. I don't know, you maybe came in slightly there. But um, so the, the, the optimum time of harvesting and then how do you process it? Uh, I was ha happy to be with um, some of the Sklalem tribe when they were doing some cedar bark collecting. And I just learned a teeny bit about how they collected and processed the cedar bark. And that was just uh, such a, um, a pleasure and an honor to be able to do that. Um, so how to process it is, is really important. I also want to know as I'm observing which flowers are fragrant, which ones are visited by what kind of pollinators, what feeds the honeybees. I'm also wanting to know their, 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 their role in the ecosystem via the insects. Um, I want to know also what eats it. Are there plants, are there critters that eat it? Uh, things that it repels, what is its role in the ecosystem, is it a ground cover, is it habitat, uh, what, uh, so I want to know its ecological role as well as its, what, what it's good for for humans, what's its role in the whole ecosystem, what part does it play in that web of life, because every ecosystem is a community, a web of life, and the more diversity in that community, the more stable and resilient it is, and the more simple it becomes, the less resilient it is. And so the 
the goal, goal of a rest ecosystem restoration camp is to increase biodiversity. Mainly we do that through with plants. Uh, we can also bring in microorganisms, fungi, uh, arthropods, et cetera. But mainly it's where you bring in the plants and they create the conditions for the other life forms. I also want to know how to collect the seeds of all the plants, um, that I, at least the ones I would want to collect the seeds from. I don't know them all, but I have collected a lot of seeds over the years. And so I need to know how to collect it. When is, it, what, when is the right time to collect that seed? Some, some are ripe for only like a couple of days and then they're gone. Um, other things hang on for months. So you have to know when to collect it and then how to clean it out and then how to propagate those seeds or propagate the plants. And as an ecosystem restoration person, plant propagation is one of the main fields of study. You have to know how to propagate the plants and then uh, of course, how to establish them. Um, okay, and then I'd like to be able to identify that plant or all the plants in all the seasons, like in the winter, I can say, oh, look, there's a cascara tree. I can tell by the naked buds. Oh, look, that's a, that's a service berry. That is, I can tell by looking at the winter buds, the form of the tree, what all the shrubs are when they have no leaves or anything on. They're just naked here in the uh, temperate zone, most of them. So I want to be able to identify things at all season. If a little baby plant is coming out of the ground, I want to know what that baby plant is. And I'm pretty good in my garden. I'm really pretty good on the weeds. Um, but, uh, you know, also learning that it's like, oh, here comes that first little shoot. That's going to be a wild onion or that's going to be uh, so and so. So learning the plants at all stages of their growth. So you're always uh, familiar. So those are the kind of things that I want to learn about the plants where I live. And the, and the, the more you uh, study, the more you learn. Um, and uh, so this is a lifelong quest. I've lived all around the Pacific, well, quite a few places in the Pacific Northwest, East and West side. So I'm, I'm really familiar with the flora on both sides of the state, both sides in the Northwest. And um, that makes me a useful plant walk person in this whole area. Um, I once did a plant walk, a useful plant walk in Hawaii, on Kauai. And I was like, oh my gosh, trepidatious. I'm just this outside, Howley foreigner, <laughs> gringo, and uh, don't know the floor that well, but I studied quite a bit. I have been studying for some years and I had a lot of other good people on the walk. And so it was a great plant walk. And I knew quite a bit of this stuff and other people filled in. So if you can lead a plant walk, even if you're not an expert, because the other people on the plant walk will help uh, fill you in. Of course, the less you know, the more embarrassing it is. But uh, it's always good to start. Um, so what to know about plants? Here we're, we're doing pretty good here. Um, advice. So as you, as you learn, I'd like to put this idea out there, something that a lot of us modern people don't think about. You can become a, tr a carrier of traditional knowledge. It is as a plant person, it is my goal, or it is it, it just sort of ha so happens as I do my study that I become a source of more and more uh, knowledge about the plants. And a lot of that comes from traditional knowledge. I study a lot of ethnobotanies. Um, a lot of it comes from going, hanging out with herbalists and learning about herbal medicines. Um, the knowledge of the plants and their uses gradually accumulates. And, and in a sense, a lot, some of that I, I sort of came up with more recently or personally, you might say discovered for myself or uh, read in modern books. And, and part of it actually is what we would call traditional knowledge, but it all becomes sort of a, we are all in a sense creating the new traditional knowledge and or carrying it on, not creating, but we're carrying on the traditional plant knowledge of the world. So when I study uh, French peasants' use of, uh, of plants up there in the, in the Alps, I am learning traditional knowledge from them. And then that becomes part of my knowledge. And I pass it on to my children. I pass it on to people in these YouTube webinars. So we can all become part of carrying on traditional knowledge. 
um, even whether you're a traditional indigenous person or not. Of course, they have perhaps the, hopefully the opportunity to learn from their elders and, and that keeping that traditional knowledge alive and also, in a sense, recreating it and also talking to the ancestors because ancestors are still around to help give us that information as well. So we, the, uh, I can think of a few people in life and I'm, I'm gonna mention Nancy Turner. Nancy Turner is probably one of the most important uh, ethnobotanist, uh, most well-known in the, in the uh, United States and, or North America since she's Canadian. And she's in uh, University of British Columbia. I think she's about just retired or, but after a long career. And, and Nancy Turner is just a wonderful, sweet woman. And as a result, she has gained the hearts of many, many indigenous people, tribal people across British Columbia. She has dozens and dozens, I would probably say hundreds of friends of indigenous people. And she goes on walks with them and they go out gathering things. And she has learned so much of the traditional knowledge of the British Columbia peoples. And so, and she wasn't raised in a traditional society, but she is now, and she, I remember her talk, talking one time and she said, you know, I, I started working with the indigenous people a long time ago and, and uh, a lot of the old traditional elders that I learned from have passed on. And a lot of their children didn't learn that knowledge. And now the grandchildren are coming to my classes and I'm passing on the grandmother's knowledge to the grandkids um, because there was a generation gap there. And I just, there, so Nancy Turner is an example of a person not raised in an indigenous way that can, um, that, that can help carry that information forward. So we all have the opportunity in some way or another to gather plant knowledge and help keep it alive for future generations. So I encourage, you know, um, uh, I encourage everybody, and no matter what age you are to start, but I, you know, especially a lot of these ecosystem restoration camp people are gonna be young people in their 20s and 30s, you know, you could really do a lot in your lifetime with your plant knowledge if you, you know, so set, set that as one of your goals in your life's career. It uh, brings endless enjoyment, lots of pleasant smelling flowers, uh, and much peace of mind. It's actually probably one of the most best things you can do for yourself mentally is go out and do this sort of stuff. Um, okay. Uh, some other advice for camps. I wrote down a series of things here. Let's see if I can find a couple more that I haven't mentioned yet. Um, make friends with the locals. So the, the first ecosystem restoration camp up in the Altiplano, they, um, you know, they started, they established this, this camp on this, uh, large farm up old farm up there and uh i don't and i don't know the story of how well they related to the locals i'll bet they did a pretty good job but it certainly should be the aim of any re ecosystem restoration camp to be on good communication terms with the locals and not have the locals hate them that's not a good thing so you want to have friends with the local people because they can help you out and you should be helping them out so how can how can uh, ecosystem restoration camp make friends with the locals, other indigenous people, traditional agriculturists, who, who around there has plant knowledge that you can learn from. And so uh, you, a lot of them, like I said, they can come and do plant walks or give you advice or show you how to do things. So uh, an ecosystem restoration camp that's blended into or integrated into the uh, community is just uh, so much safer and, and, uh, and more influential in local things uh, as, as rather than just being those outsiders that nobody really trusts or understands. So, um, so make friends with the locals. Okay, looking through the notes here, I have 
I know there's another part of the list here somewhere. So, okay, another bit of advice is that for each re ecosystem restoration camp is that you make a plant species list for your, um, well, certainly for the property you're on. Every plant that is observed there, whether you, anybody knows it or not, is made reference to. When I go on a plant walk, I guarantee to people that I will, I will give them the names of every single plant that we see. And it, it, it just so happens that I will know most of the names, but if I don't have a name for it, I make one up. That way I can say that I gave them a name. So if you find a plant and you don't know what it is, give it a name, a descriptive name or a fun name, and then eventually you'll learn what that plant is and then you'll have that. So keep a list of all the plants that are on a, on a piece of property. Uh, especially if the, ecosystem, if the uh, camp is on a small property, well, or even if it's on a larger property, it's also good to make note of the plant species that are found in the area around it. You might say, wow, they had the best stand of this native wildflower uh, that I've ever seen you know, in the area and there is none on our property. So one of the goals of a restoration uh, camp is not only to increase the native plants on site, but what has been exterminated or extirpated? What's missing from the site? What used to be there? What was there when it was in a more pristine condition? So knowing um, all the things that uh, should be growing or could be growing on your place that are locally native, uh, that's, a, that's, that's part of what your job is, is to identify what isn't on the site and to bring it back. And so that might mean collecting seeds or propagation material from local stands and bringing over to the property or growing it out for a while first is more likely uh, and then plant it out. So uh, knowing what could or should be there is, a, is an important facet of a restoration camp. And, and the, one of the ways to do that is to get some local well, there's two ways. One is to get a, a local flora. What is the most local flora you can get? And it will give a list of all the plants found in that site. And you can look and then compare it to your own and say, wow, we have 50% of what uh, uh, is, uh, could be found here. Uh, an, another way is to go to the best ecosystems and most intact, least disturbed ecosystems in your area, probably as some kind of a refuge or botany, uh, botanical uh, or uh, reserve forest perhaps. But anyway, go to some of the best ecosystems left in your area and look at the plants there to get an idea of what uh, could be growing on your place. Of course, that's if you have a similar habitat. So you're looking for the best examples for the similar habitats where you uh, are to get an idea of what you might be trying to restore back to and to give you some more ideas. So uh, make that list of, of plants that you think or should be added back into the property. Okay, well that was quick. I've actually pretty much covered most of what um, I wanted to cover here. And we still have 15 minutes, my gosh. Um, Maybe, maybe, maybe we can get a couple questions or, uh, or get a conversation going from anybody there that thinks of anything, uh, Lisa, for instance, or any, any of the rest of you um, want to go into something a little deeper or. No, I don't have any questions, but I, I wanted to say that I really like that idea. Um, we're starting a wellness and community garden for the tribe, and um, it's surrounded by, it's right along the river and surrounded by um, the woods and river plants. And I think it's a great idea to, um, that, that game to go out and find, t well, it'd be, 10 would be too many for kids, but it might be okay for the adults. 
and then bring back 10 you know and 10 you don't know. I really like that. So I'll be using that. I'll be taking that idea. Okay. Yeah, I, I do that a lot with uh, my classes. So, um, and, and Lisa, I, I did stop by this year and looked at the garden um, at the Jamestown Squallum site there. And and I was like, um, and I looked at it last summer too. And I'll, this is an aside, folks, but I, I work with Lisa helping put in a traditional plants garden at uh, their place. And um, they didn't do very well for the most part. And I realized later when I went back is that the, the fertilization was just not right. I mean, they're, it, they really needed more fertilizer and I never got around to giving it to them. And the same thing goes this year. So maybe, and I do have a few more native plants I could bring too. Should we, maybe we no. should get together? Are you still, is that still ongoing? Yeah, it is, but I've, um, it is a bad area. So I'm moving to a different area. <laughs> Ah. I'm gonna gonna try something else. Um, in fact, I um, went and rescued some of the the onions. Seem to be doing good. The nodding, or it was either the nodding or the hooker. I'm not sure. Um, so I did take one of those for a future. Um, I'll plant it somewhere else. Um, we're getting a new building too, but um, yeah, I kind of nothing is doing well there. So I. I assume that it's just not. This is the soil that they brought in. Yeah. They brought in this soil. They call it soil. It looked kind of like soil. Yeah, it was, it was pretty bad. <laughs> pretty bad. So um, I do have some Pacific crab apples for you at least and, uh, and some Douglas and some black hawthorn if you'd like them. I could bring them by. Well, since uh, we talked, I also started a berry farm and I have the hawthorn and um, what was the other thing you, the Douglas what? Uh, Douglas Hawthorne and Pacific Crab Apple. Oh, that's the, the native, little native crab apples? Yep. Okay. Got to have that. We had quite a few. Um, they were from the conservation district, so I'm, I'm just waiting to see how they, how many okay. survive. That's where mine are from. So we better not take up webinar time too oh, much. Sorry. <laughs> But it's okay, Lisa. I, I, I wanted you to, I just wanted to go into that a little bit, but we better uh, back out of there. But uh, it's, uh, it's nice that you're helping carry on the skull, you know, the Jamestown Sklalem's, uh tribal heritage there. So that's great. Yeah, sorry, everyone. I didn't mean to get carried away there. <laughs> okay, well, I look forward. I'm glad that you're still paying attention. And uh, uh, I'll, I'll look forward to more later. Um, so yeah, so where, so any other, anything else pop, pop, pop up for anyway? Mahela. So can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so would you, you may have mentioned this when I was out, but would you wait for the pollinators to come back or would you provide pollinators or the animals? Um, for the most part, they just, ha they, they ha there has to be something for them to eat. So first you have to create the new food source and then they can come to bring them before you bring much of the food, the food source has to build up. So for the most part, here's an example from the Philippines, which I think is, is a really good example for the ecosystem restoration camps. Uh, there's a huge amount of degraded land in the Philippines. They basically cut down almost all of their forests and they were magnificent forests. Uh, some of the best forests on the planet. And they cut them almost all down during the 1900s. And a lot of it was overtaken by these giant grasses uh, and the soil became leached out and just really a poor situation. So they came up with something called reinforestation farming. And what they did is they, 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 they helped local farmers to, uh, I imagine they had maybe gave them plants, I'm not quite sure the whole scenario but they helped them get going with putting in uh, a food plants as well as native rainforest plants. So they were mixing non-native food plants and, and native food plants and native rainforest species. Uh, and as a result, and, and they were very successful at, the, at the, these. And they, they, they ended up with um, lots of food for the for the little farmers these were small scale people two and a half five acres ten acres very small plots and and they were able to feed their families get some income it was working out really well and at the same time all these native 
uh, non-native plants create structure and habitat and pollinators and all that good stuff too in the system. But the, 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 they, these new rainforests uh, with partially native and partially non-native, all of a sudden animals and birds and insects and bats and reptiles and amphibians started showing up on the sites and people didn't know where they came from. They, they, they were cut off from miles and miles of, of other habitat. And all of a sudden, the species that lived there came back on their own. And so that's what, and same with the pollinator question there, that if you create the structure that has the food and the habitat, et cetera, then they can come back. And for the most part, they will come back on their own. You don't need to import them. Uh, you might have to in some, I mean, it probably wouldn't hurt to, in, in some cases, but a lot of it happens naturally. Uh, during COVID crisis, it's been noted on the web that uh, because humanity has pulled back from some ecosystems and isn't doing as much uh, work out there, that actually the wildlife have been coming back more into into cities and farmlands and the what the, the sort of like the wildlife is venturing from its strongholds from its you know and venturing back out again so they're expanding yeah. a little bit and so there's this dance basically humans have been pushing back nature for centuries and millennia um but we're fine you know they're just getting a little brief respite um anyway i better not say too much uh bad about humanity here but uh humanity is uh, um it's got a lot of answer for and we can become really productive and helpful and and healing parts of the landscape instead of just being a bunch of bullies uh, killing things around us um, humans have a bad reputation uh, galactically and uh we really need to um, change our ways and so ecosystem restoration is hopefully the movement of the future. It's the movement of the of the uh, 21st century, and we don't know how that's going to play out. It could be that uh, people just wake up and say, "Oh yes, we have to be nice to the earth, and we're going to start doing all this uh, great ecosystem restoration." And some people are doing that increasingly, mm -hmm. but also it could be that uh, uh, COVID and further developments and and economic turmoil and depressions. Uh, it looks like economic depression, we're just getting started as a guess. Uh, and, and as a result, there's going to be a lot of people that are going to have to start growing their own food. The gardening movement in the United States has just gone through the roof this year. And a lot more people <clears throat> want to start uh, being more productive and, and have time to garden. And ecosystem restoration coupled with food production and permaculture and ethnobotany and traditional people's uh, management of the environment, that if we put all those things together, we can live in a much more beautiful world, a much more ecological world, much more productive world. <clears throat> the future is bright. If humans would uh, figure it, would uh, collectively get on it here. And if the powers that be kind of didn't uh, <clears throat> sort of get in the way. <laughs> So, um, I, I have, I have, uh, I know that the future can be really bright, and we're trying to come up with some positive visions in a very dire time right now. And so, ecosystem restoration and permaculture offer positive solutions towards a greater good end, and uh, and the knowledge of traditional peoples around the world, their spiritual and practical knowledge, both are very important to the world at this time. And so it's really, it's good that there's more bridge building there though. It is sad that uh, almost everywhere indigenous people in the world are still under the gun or repressed in some way. Um, but there is some progress being made folks. So stay tuned and you can visit our friendsofthetrees.net website. Friends of the Trees has a YouTube channel. Um, and Friends of the Trees has an uh, botanicals has an Instagram page, and uh, on our website, I think you can sign up for our newsletter. I think we have four thousand four hundred or four thousand six hundred people on our <clears throat> email list right now. Um, 
but we're always trying to uh, serve more people out there in, in various ways. So uh, people can uh, stay in touch with what we're up to uh, and, um, and also really stay in touch with the ecosystem restoration and, uh, and promote their stuff. And you, you can become a, I think it costs something like $11 a month to become one of their sustaining members. So every month, uh, $11 comes out of your account and goes into theirs and they use it to help fund camps. And I, it's, it's like, it's a really, if you're looking for something to salve your conscience because you have a, because you've done something naughty ecologically, send $11 a month to ecosystem restoration camps and, uh, and be one of their supporters. So uh, I recommend that to people. Oh, well, other last minute comments here. I'm, I'm going to try to write up uh, some of today's talk and put it on my website too. So um, you might be able to find that there. Uh, there's a lot of information on my website. If you, if you uh, scurry around, I'm, 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 I just realized that I, I have this great uh, long gardening piece on uh, gardening and hard, feeding yourself in hard times, gardening in hard times. And, uh, Looks like they're coming, folks. So I'm going to dust that article off and, and put it up front and center. Uh, oh, it's called Feeding People in Hard Times. Feeding People in Hard Times. So we'll put that up there. Um, okay. So I think that's, I think that's about it. And do you want to say anything at the end here? I will say that this is the last of, six, I believe we did six webinars here at, for Finn River. And um, I think four of them are up online right now. And I was just looking